everyone. This is Frank Riker. And this is Darren Sands. And this is a Slaughter Lamb podcast. Darren, what's going on? I'm good. After what's been one of the worst weeks in British history, I think, uh, I'm holding up okay. I've been watching a lot of... Yeah. (laughs) I've been watching a lot of... um, I found a new show. Well, it's not new. It's a couple of years old. But it's kind of tucked away on one of the channels that's on um, Amazon Prime. And it's called Pennyworth. I don't know if you've ever seen it or heard about it, but it's on a it's on a, um, a station over in the U.S. called Epix. Okay, uh, it's based on Alfred Pennyworth, who was Bruce Wayne's butler in Batman, and his early years of having just left the um, SAS and setting up his own security company. I was shocked, actually. I don't know if you've ever watched it, but this thing is like as someone described it to me: Kingsman on steroids. It's it's a full on R rated or eighteen rated if you're in England experience with um, some shocking violence, language, nudity, um, everything. The kitchen sinks in there. It's great fun. I've, I've just finished the first series and um, I'm looking forward to starting the second, which is just about to air over here. Yeah, it's a, it's it's actually before he he meets um, I think Martha. Wayne first um, in the series because it's their it's all their younger versions, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, it, Bruce is not even born. You know, no, it's, yeah, it's, that's right. And Wayne Enterprises is not as a trillion dollar, billion dollar, or gazillion dollar company at this point. <laughs> no. But yeah, it's the whole story of Alfred, and, and yeah. Alfred kicks ass. He's he's fantastic in it. That young kid, he's playing it as um, a sort of young. Um, Michael Caine, I guess, rather than a young Michael Goff, who was the um, the butler in uh, the Tim Burton Batman. So it's kind of more in line with sort of Nolan's vision than it is Burton's vision. Um, but yeah, it's a kind of stylized world as well. You know, there's still, although it's set in the, I guess it's set in the, the sort of 50s, 60s, um, there's kind of still public executions and people getting you know hung drawn and quartered in the streets and things it's uh yeah it's pretty nasty it's pretty nasty it's not a it's not a young jeremy irons uh no it's nothing none of that (laughs) although that that is out this week the snyder cuts out this week which four more days take a look yeah i'll take a look at that even though it's kind of what is it about 15 hours long or something i don't know because you guys um you finally got hbo max over there right or the no no, we don't. No, it's not actually available in this country as yet. But we, we the HBO do have a deal, deal with Sky Television in the UK, so we can access all that content um, within Sky TV. But, um, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to watching the Snyder Cut. I'm not sure if it's going to... It can't be any worse than uh, Joss Whedon's cut. So... <laughs> I, think, I think people are just looking forward to seeing maybe a different movie, a different yeah, scene, yeah. which uh, from what I've seen, you know, the stills from... It looks like it could be entertaining. I've I've been watching, catching up on a uh, series over here on Stars called uh, American Gods. Uh, okay, I've been watching the uh, second season of it, dealing with all the ancient gods, you know, versus new gods, such as you know, there's a god for technology versus the god of uh, you know Odin's in it, uh, going back and forth for the devotion of followers. Uh, I've been Is catching. It, um- is it Ian McShane? Correct. Yeah, in uh, Crispin right, yeah. Lovers in it. Yeah, uh, yeah. and I've, it's it's I've, once you, it's one of those it's one of those TV series where you just have to follow it all the way through because you watch the first season and you're just like you know it's going to get more interesting and, and more messed up and, and which it has. And then I also been reading today, March 14th, as of today, that Avatar is now the king of worldwide box office. Because it was released in China <laughs> again. <laughs> I don't know how I mean, you feel about that, but I think it should be initial release thing. Not, I mean, because what Avengers Endgame can come and do it again five years later. Oh, of and, course it will, will mean, do. There'll be some cut that they'll release of Avengers that will kind of sneak past um, uh, Avatar. But you know, it's, it's fair enough, I guess. I don't rate Avatar as a movie at all. Especially now, I think it just looks so dated within the, kind of, what, 10 years since it was released. I don't know what people want with another... These movies are dated until 2028. So we've got one next year, one in 2024, 26, and 28. It's, um, Who gives it's, a shit? I, 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 think, <laughs> I don't think the sequel will be number one. 
That's my personal opinion. It well, wasn't be, the whole thing know. kind of zeitgeist? You know, it was of its yeah. time, and and, um, and it was right on the cusp of that sort of, you know, the peak of 3D. Um, the colors and everything. That was the yeah, whole... Yeah, the 3D fad. Uh, but, you know, know, I don't know. It's, it's it, like you said, it's not one of my favorite movies. It's not one of my favorite alien-ish, you know, uh, outer space, extraterrestrial type. Not like the one we're going to talk about right now. No, I'd rather stick to the to the to the hunter. Yeah, we're going to be talking about 1987's Predator. We are a rescue team, not assassins. Now, what do we got to do? In a part of the world where there are no rules. We pick up their trailer at the chopper, run them down, grab those hostages before anybody knows we were there. What do you mean, we? Deep in the jungle, where nothing that lives is safe. You lose it here, you're in a world of hurt. Showtime, kid. Knock, knock. An elite rescue squad. You're bleeding, man. I ain't got time to bleed. <laughs> is being led by the ultimate warrior. We need the best. That's why you're here. But now... What's got Billy so spooked? There's something out there waiting for us. And it ain't no man. They're up against the ultimate enemy. Holy mother of God. Nothing like it has ever been on Earth before. She says the jungle just came alive and took him. We cannot see it. No blood, no bodies. We hit nothing. But it sees the heat of our bodies and the heat of our fear. Whatever it is out there, it killed Hopper. And now it wants us. It kills for pleasure. Ah! He was skinned alive! It hunts for sport. He's killing us one at a time. We're all gonna die. But this time, it's picked the wrong man to hunt. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Fox presents Arnold Schwarzenegger. Predator. The hunt begins Friday, June 12th at theaters everywhere. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Carl Weathers, Kevin Peter Hall. You could you could name the, the list of, of men and testosterone that are on this in this movie. It just goes on and on. Do you remember yeah, the funny. first time you saw this? Um I do. I um, it came out shortly before RoboCop, and RoboCop I snuck in. We talked about before. I snuck into the cinema to see that movie around that time as well. I think I snuck in and watched part of Predator, and then again got turfed out and had to wait until the um, the, the the VHS release to kind of watch the rest of it. But you know. Uh, when I did get finally get to see it on its VHS release, I just bloody loved it. I thought it was a fantastic idea. Even now, even watching it the other day, I was I was sitting there just admiring how smart of a film it is. With all that, as you say, with all those kind of that ragtag brigade of bloody testosterone in there, mm. it's still a really smart movie. And John McTiernan deserves a hell of a lot of credit for directing what he did. And it was his first studio film. Yeah, and also the first collaboration between the two brothers that read it and. Had had no representation jim and yeah. uh john thomas jim and john thomas they basically figuratively slipped it underneath the door the script was dreamt up kind of about a few months after rocky 4 had been released and so the kind of pitch for this was um rocky meets alien <laughs> <laughs> And that's true. That comes from McTiernan and himself, you know. That was the whole pitch, was Rocky meets Alien, and, and, and what a coup for them to get Carl Weathers in this movie. Oh, yeah. It, I mean, it's, that first opening, well, you know, it, it doesn't explain a lot, though, because the first thing we see is an alien ship blast something into Central America, somewhere around there. But it It's very mean, reminiscent of The Thing, the opening yes. scene in The Thing. yes. And the next uh, scene we see is that awesome score. Which actually makes me think of either somebody running or the motion of footsteps when I hear that. Yeah. It's the fast yeah. pacing. It's know. being chased, isn't it? Yeah. The, 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 it's the, a hunt. Prey and predator. 
you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as soon as that door opens, or the helicopter that's being landed on this beach, which is supposed to be like a part of Costa Rica or somewhere in South uh, Central America, but it's actually being filmed in Mexico. You have all these, test- like we said before, testosterone-filled uh, rescue team come off, and there's Arnold as cool as he could be, sitting in the back smoking a cigar. He does look cool. And that first handshake that he does with um, with Dylan. Dylan! You son of a bitch. It's got to be the, the most manly handshake I've ever seen in my life. Not just on film, but ever. I know some big guys and they've got some great handshakes, but none of them top that. You know, the... Uh... It's there. They agree. You could tell that the studio either uh, spritzed them or greased up their arms to get those veins popping out and saying, uh, what's the matter? CIA getting pushing too many pencils. What's with this tie bullshit, man? Fuck the tie. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at the cast because it's interesting how some of the cast came together. I think Jesse Ventura was sort of recommended by Arnie. Mm-hmm. Um, had they done Run- Running Man at that point? Yeah. yeah, they'd done Running Man already, hadn't they? And it, what I find really fascinating is why is how Shane Black came to be on the film. Um, because Shane Black, as we know, is a is a screenwriter, um, not really an actor at all. They wanted him to do. Um, they wanted him to polish the script, like a treatment. Um, and um, Shane Black refused. He said, "No, I don't want to. I don't want to get involved. What you've got is perfectly fine." And so McTiernan just said, "Well, I tell you what. Why don't you be in the movie? The studio wouldn't have a wouldn't pay for a writer on set." And so they gave the job of uh, the, the role of Hawkins to Shane Black. So they had what you know, they'd filled the role of Hawkins, and they also had a writer on set all the time. Good thinking. Not a bad idea at all. Yeah, we have to talk about the other um, veteran on this uh, movie as part of the cast, uh, Chavez. Right? He was. Uh, yeah. He was he was in Vietnam along with Jesse, so they were the only two cast members that actually had military experience on how to handle weapons. And then he oh, yeah, wasn't wasn't Jesse a Jesse Navy Couture SEAL? Or a seal? Yeah. yeah, he was a Navy SEAL. Of course, then you have Duke. You know, who was just uh, he he worked with Arnold uh, the year before on Commando. Uh, and then you have the uh, the one that needed the bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that's what I found really strange was was uh, Sonny Landon, who we'd seen before in things like um, Forty Eight Hours, and he later was in Lockup with um, with Stallone. Mm-hmm. But the insurance company on the production insisted on a bodyguard to be on set for him, uh, and this wasn't to um, wasn't to protect him; it was to protect other people from him because he had such a short temper. <laughs> he broke shit. <laughs> Yeah, and so they so they had like a six foot eight dude on set. I mean, sh- it's, Sunny Landon's big enough as it is, so they had to find a bodyguard that was you know that was intimidated enough to kind of uh, keep him in check, which I just think's hilarious. I've never heard of that before, but you know, it's something that John McTiernan, and you know he doesn't mind telling you at all. He's, he's, I've seen him mention it a few times over the years about this bodyguard. He's uh, his handler. Yeah, his handler. <laughs> Wrangler. <laughs> I don't know what it must have been like on that set with all those egos. It must have been a tough, tough old time because he's quite a small guy, is John mm-hmm. McTiernan. He's um, he's a rough looking guy, but he's a small guy. He speaks really th- fondly of his time on that on that set with those guys. But I would imagine that, that the likes of Jesse Ventura and and Sonny Landon were pretty uh, tough to handle. He did say out of out of all of them, the most professional one on set was was Carl Weathers because he had a pedigree he'd got a past he'd been in movies since the early 70s yeah. and so you know he was probably the most respected cast member on the set just because of his experience so dutch is arnold schwarzenegger's character's name they're a rescue team right there that's that's all their mission is is to go get this what they say this diplomat uh yeah this is a cabinet minister who's in a missing. helicopter crash yeah and they, they they think there may be survivors they don't so find any- this Oh, no, this this bunch are sent in, um, but it soon has become apparent that there's maybe some false pretenses involved. Yeah, I mean the first uh, their first indication of that is um, a couple soldiers skinned hanging up in a tree. They were green berets, you know, going after this supposed cabinet uh, cabinet minister. But yeah, but something doesn't smell right, and uh, they come up upon the village that they think these 
uh, revolutionaries are at, which happens to be, I think, one of our favorite gunfight scenes. It's incredible. Yeah, you know, this little it, village is being taken out. Yeah, this is the assault on the compound is just, it's just incredible second unit work. Pretty much every, I would say every three to four seconds, there is some sort of stunt explosion, squib work, death, you name it. It's just, it's, it's such a violent assault. You know, you got guys being blown up, guys being, you know, gutted, knifed, burnt. Um, the set's been destroyed everywhere you look. There's some incredible explosions. And, and it's a kind of like a two to three minute sequence of just pure adrenaline. It's, it's fantastic. And that, that was the goal when they set out, I think, was to make it like one of the best action sequences put to film. Mm -hmm. And it never really dawned on, some, on me until I was watching it yesterday uh, how good that sequence is. I've, you know, I've seen it loads of times over the years, but yesterday, looking at it through, you know, and taking notes and looking at it through the eyes of wanting to do this podcast... I was just in awe of it. I think it's just stunning. Yeah. A I mean, five year old action sequence like that. It's, it's, it's amazing and so well choreographed. And still holds up because the weapons are still around. Yeah. And there are still like little camps out there like that. I mean, how many one liners just from this one scene can you remember? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got stick around. You've got... I ain't got time to bleed. I ain't got time to bleed. That's just... <laughs> you're bleeding. I ain't got time to bleed. There, there's some there's some great one-liners. What was the other... Oh, knock, knock. Knock, knock. Was it... <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's, it's terrific fun. And they obviously had a great time filming it. And when you, what's really um, terrifying is when you look at some of the B-roll footage of this sequence and how close everybody was to the to the action and some of those explosions... You know, I don't think it would be staged like that today at all. I think that people would be well back from the mm -hmm. from devices being detonated, and it was pretty full on. Yeah, and there's only one woman in this whole village. Yes, Anna. I mean, <laughs> that's scary. <laughs> you know, she's only she's basically the only one that survives this mayhem. But it but it was later found out after the whole uh, assault happened that it was just a CIA cover up. Dylan. Uh, was orchestrated this whole thing, and he was uh, him and Dutch are not on good terms at this point because you know they knew each other back in the day and trusted each other, and the CIA basically changed Dylan. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. this is the first time we actually get after this whole thing when they take Anna, you know, as a hostage or maybe collateral damage, make sure she doesn't go off and spill the beans of where they are. We see the predator for the first time don't we behind the mask kind of yeah they're, they're not kind of aware that they're actually being tracked and hunted at this point and as we said at the start the hunter was the actual original working title for this movie and then halfway mm -hmm. through production as with a lot of things on this film they changed it the hunter's not a bad name i don't think it's it's you know it kind of works but it was changed to the predator and then I think eventually, as they got close to the release, they dropped the from the title, and it's just Predator. But yeah, they take Anna as um, as a hostage, and it then starts to dawn on them that not only have they been duped into the you know go, doing the mission that they've just done, but they're also being hunted out there, which they and, think um, is from another insurrection or another force, not necessarily something from outer space. Now the next scene, Hawkins gets dragged. Right, he's the first victim of this by this creature, or you know, Anis sees is basically camouflaged. It's a mirror object of everything around them. You know, as it's camouflaged, he mirrors it off his body, and uh, she's just terrified. You know that she keeps on saying the jungle keeps. You know, the jungle came back and took him, and then Blaine gets it. He gets. We see the first time. Uh, you know, this laser that comes out of the trees, and Mac who's a witness of this because Blaine and uh, you know Mac are friends in another great scene where they basically chopped out a rainforest to put some houses up eventually <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of that scene when you first saw that were they were they 
basically try to hunt this thing by throwing everything they had at it for at least what seemed like a good 10 minutes. Oh, it's great fun, and you get to, you know, you get a good old uh, look at the old Painless in action, which Jesse Ventura's, for those of you familiar with it, he has this this kind of machine gun, mini gun. gun. Yeah. And I was reading up about this, and it's actually capable of firing 6,000 rounds per minute. And it, I love the noise it makes as well, that just mm-hmm. kind of... And it's it also that sort of, when it runs out of ammo as well, that kind of whistle it makes as the uh, the barrel's still spinning. Like a hair dryer. A, <laughs> yeah, his, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it's, and actually, that gun, they pulled off a helicopter. Is that where it was from? They, they took it out, and uh, they said that Jesse was only was one of the few people that actually can lift it. It's incredible. I, I, I honestly, for years, I thought it was a prop that, that, that they'd made just for this film. And then you realize afterwards, no, that it's an actual thing. Mm-hmm. And they had to adjust the, the amount of rounds per minute that it, that it pumped out to, to 1,250 rather than 6,000. And I guess that was probably because it was easier to handle, and also it probably saved them on blanks as well. <laughs> oh yeah, and 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 when you talk about handling, the weight, you know, had to be because uh, the the bullets for that thing the are out of a backpack. Um, could you imagine six thousand rounds on one pretty big fucking backpack? Oh, <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> yeah, I I love that when I seen that as a kid. I remember being glued to it and just watching there with my mouth open and looking at my father. And my father's just doing the same thing, you know. And um, but we found out that all that damage, you know, and we know that Ponch, uh, Poncho, he loves throwing those grenade launchers everywhere, yeah. and they don't hit anything. Well, they they make make the predator bleed a little bit. But let's talk about the predator because we we first see what he looks like. I mean, he's an alien. He's got these. He's got this helmet. On, he's got some sort of dreadlocks, but that wasn't the initial first look, was it? No, he was more like um, some sort of chicken crossed with an insect or something. I don't know. Ray it was just Mantis, bizarre, right, wasn't it? Well, that, this testament to the whole cast because you know they spend the best part of eighty minutes reacting to something that they, as cast members, have never seen at all. Because there was this whole kind of, you know, the Predator was being worked on in the background, um, and there was a whole delay with it being delivered to the set, you know, the, the actual full working costume. And I think in the meantime, what they had was, they had um, a guy in a red suit, didn't they? Mm-hmm. A kind of, um, almost like a green screen type uh, affair, if you like. But Filming back all then, the camouflaging. Yeah, yeah. So it would show up on the the heat camera. And did you did you did I hear rightly? Because I was listening to the commentary the other day. They actually tried a monkey in a suit for a while. They did. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that was. There's a Mighty bit in the Joe film Young. where. Yeah, there's a bit in the film where um, there's a scorpion on Dylan's back, and Max spears it with it at the end of his knife, and they actually kill a, a live scorpion in the film for this one shot. And, and John McTiernan says. Um, you know, oh yes, folks, we did. We killed a, a scorpion for this movie, but you know, we didn't. We didn't mistreat any other animals on the set. And it's like you fucking dressed up a monkey in a red suit and threw it in the trees. And you took <laughs> down half the forest. <laughs> Some bird is feeding its babies, and then all of a sudden, a grenade launcher shows up in its nest. <laughs> but they said that the monkey hated being in this fucking red suit. It's, oh, you don't say. Uh, and, it, and it and it just hid. It, apparently, it just hid in the forest. And they realised that you know we can't use a fucking monkey for this. So, so, so they got the next the, the next best thing next to a best chip. thing. <laughs> Jean Claude Van Damme. <laughs> <laughs> Who yeah, was some of you may do some kicks. <laughs> <laughs> some of you may know this, others may not. But if you Google this. You will see that originally the Predator itself was played, the first iteration of it on set was played by Jean-Claude Van Damme. And there was actually photographs on the internet of him on set. There's also a, um, a photograph of him in the actual costume um, with this kind of bug head on, which just looks fucking terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> but apparently he moped and whinged his way around that set for a couple of reasons. One, because he couldn't do any of his bloody kung fu... <laughs> <laughs> his kung fu. 
or whatever it is he does. <laughs> and two, because his face was never going to be on screen. So in the end, they just said, they showed the studio some of the rushes and just said, look, you know, is this what we really want? Look at the state of this costume you've given us. And they said, no, no, that's not what we want at all. And so Van Damme was fired and they went back to the drawing board with the costume. And they had to shut down production. Mm -hmm. Now, luckily, the first half of the, or the first 80 minutes of the movie, as we know, doesn't have a, really a shot of the Predator in it. You just see these kind of mirrored images of it with its invisibility mode, if you like. Which is actually um, Jean-Claude. Yeah. So that's, that's, um, just, that's him, actually, when you see oh, is Hawkins. It really? Yeah, when Hawkins gets dragged, that's actually Jean-Claude. Van Damme. Yeah. Okay. Is he credited at all? No, because he's too much no. of a prick. <laughs> <laughs> I could see McTira going. This 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 prick wants to start kicking in this suit and everything, and, and doing backflips and shit. <laughs> yeah. What is the predator doing the splits over there? <laughs> <laughs> Look at him. He's chopping bricks. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we could have had you know Bloodsport Predator Edition after you know. <laughs> You know, when, before they fired him, but yeah, but uh, uh, but when they brought on board Stan Winston and they sat this down, was and, Arnie's idea was yeah. They, they, they said, well, "Listen, I, I got a good friend. His name's Stan Winston. Never heard of him. Uh, he uh, helped me with the Terminator. And at this time, Stan Winston was probably becoming a household name hmm. uh, with what he was been doing and." Um, they, he thought of this uh, idea and what the Predator should look like on a plane, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think he was with. Uh, he was either doing some promotional work or, or production work. I can't remember now for Aliens, and he was with James Cameron, right? Yep, sitting right next to him. So yeah, so so I think Cameron. We I guess we have a, him to thank partially for the look of, of of the Predator because Winston did some sketches and showed him them and, and said. You know what I've always wanted to see um, on a monster? Mandibles. And so that's why we get that kind of jaw of the Predators, and that was all James Cameron's suggestion. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm going to have to research to see where James stole that from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to go back on some Outer Limits episode, see if I see anything, <laughs> you know, looking like Cocoon or Wolf Wolf or Brimley. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and since they got rid of Jean-Claude, was probably like, what, 5'8 or something like that? He was basically the same size. Or I think maybe Arnold was actually bigger than him in size, definitely in, in, in bulk. They had to get somebody bigger. And yeah. so they got Kevin Peter Hall, who just came off of Harry and the Hendersons. And yeah, well, Bigfoot and the Hendersons, as it was called in the in the UK. Oh, that's just ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... Peter Hall, seven foot six inches. Yeah, <laughs> and, they, and he was—he's a—he's a ballerina. He's a dancer. He's apparently a really lovely bloke. Everybody, yeah. you know, there's not everybody had a good word to say about him on the set. And he didn't um, bitch about the costume like Jean Claude did. No, and he wasn't doing the splits. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't get over the predator doing the splits. <laughs> <laughs> Kung Fu. Uh, <laughs> if it bleeds, we can kill it. Kevin Peter Hall never really moaned about the fact that it, he was in this costume for God knows how many hours a day. They they got to the stage where they figured that he could take two hours in the costume, uh, two hours on set in the costume, and they developed this kind of suit for him to wear underneath the Predator costume, which Formula One drivers wore, which had a kind of like um, some sort of water cooling system with mm -hmm. inside it. Um, but out in the Mexican jungles, it obviously it was pushing 100 degrees, and so it didn't really make much of a difference. So he, he literally could stand two hours, and then they had to get him out of it. It took between four and five hours to take the thing off. <laughs> Can you imagine four to five hours to take it all off? And he had to hold his breath putting the head thing, uh, of the the neck part of that costume. Yeah. Uh, because if if you didn't pull it down quick enough, uh, or even more, because if they pulled it down really quick, it was going to tear the costume. And they don't have a they don't have a backup. So he held his breath in order for them to snug it 
down so where he can get his head out of the yeah, top. Yeah. Cool I couldn't imagine. It's so claustrophobic. You know, like, all right, hold your breath. You may have to hold your breath for an hour. Uh, but <laughs> God. But that just shows say, you what an amazing individual he was, though. Yeah, and and, and he died what nineteen ninety five, I believe. Ninety one. Uh, Ninety one. Died just after um, uh, Part two, Predator I Two. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. He, I think he was um, thirty five years old. I think he was still old, had a career, don't you think? In movies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it would have been uh, he would have been in It Follows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe doing every Predator. Who knows? But yeah, it's uh, it's a shame he's no longer with us, and uh, he's that. Uh, it's better than, like you said, a kicking, splitting predator. <laughs> <laughs> the predators, you know, picking off the, the this this Delta Force, if you will, one by one, isn't he? We're seeing the different weapons. You know, he's using, you know, the laser. He blows Max head off. Yeah, that's pretty nasty. I, which which do you think's the most gruesome of the deaths? Definitely, I would think. Probably Dylan with his arm. That arm looks fantastic. Yeah, it looks so real. His arm's getting chopped. Uh, his arm got uh, blown off, and yeah. uh, he uh, and it's still firing the gun as it yeah. hits the ground. And, and it's the way that it's kind of. I tell you what, it reminds. There's a there's a, a one or two similarities with this movie and Jaws. One being the scene in in Jaws where the leg hits the bottom of the ocean. And that kind of bounces and, and shakes. A little blood comes out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the same with this, with, with Dylan's arm, as it's blasted off and it kind of drops to the floor in slow motion, it sort of bounces and, and looks real as it's as it's settling on the ground, still firing the ammunition. Like complete rubber. They just threw a rubber hand and just made yeah, it yeah. bounce. Yeah, it, yeah. It looks terrific. The other thing that really... and I, I don't know if anybody's ever mentioned this before. I looked this up yesterday because it, it just got me thinking... We don't see the Predator at all until it comes out of the water at the 80-minute mark, which is right, yeah. bang on the moment when the shark comes out of the water in Jaws, when it's fully revealed for the first time. When he's, when the chumming scene? Uh, the chumming scene, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah, and I've never, I've never heard anybody mention that before, and it was something that I just thought off the top of my leg, off, off the top of my leg, off the top of my head yesterday. I thought, I, this is very similar in terms of keeping this monster under wraps throughout the movie to kind of preserve all that tension. And, you know, in a similar way, because of production issues as well, you know, we all know famously the shark never worked in Jaws, and so they were unable to show it. And it, as it happened, it was for the better in the end, because... You know, people were more scared of what they couldn't see, if you like. And it works the same in this film. But the reveal of the monsters in both films is at the one hour, 20 minute mark. How bored are you? <laughs> I was actually quite pleased with myself for that. <laughs> Jesus I Christ, really Derek. about it. <laughs> <laughs> My God. So if... So... I should play both movies at the same time. Yeah. I, I, I could, you know. And uh, so should Chrissy get blown up at the time where Ponch fires his first grenade? <laughs> Chrissy doesn't get blown up. And then when he she put them together. <laughs> Listen, I, you found this little Easter egg in this little, hap <laughs> this little happy happy stance, and I'm going to find something, too. <laughs> Well, that is oh, interesting. Think, that is I, interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. I, th I think that's great. But yeah, it's very similar in terms of its setup and its pacing and its reveal and and then its final, you know, to the death moment at the end, man v beast. Yeah. Um, the Predator's full intention really is to hunt the most dangerous uh, creatures on the planet as because they're a tribal honor system species. culture. Yeah. And he's just... He's watching in the background all the all this chaos that's going on in the beginning, figuring out who's tops, who's the who's the top hunter, and um, he picks everyone off one by one. You know, you use a weapon on him, he's going to use a weapon. But he he has a, a, a flaw; he can't see uh, the body heat if it's covered. And uh, so next we see Arnold all in mud, and he's playing this kind of cat and mouse game with the predator. Yeah, no. There's, 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 there was another thing that I wanted to touch on as well, which was um, when you mentioned the, the heat vision. They brought some heat vision cameras on set to try and give everybody a kind of first-person perspective of how the Predator 
sees its prey. They run into all sorts of problems with that because obviously the, the camera picks up on heat within the jungle, but but the jungle was fucking nearly 100 degrees. It was hot already. It was hot all round. And so what they ended up having to try and do to combat this was to spray iced water all over the place and then have the cast stand next to fires and heaters before they went on to do their shot. And I think he said that from doing this, from going through this process, they, they got probably two or three decent shots. Mm -hmm. And then it was just like, it was proving too difficult to, um, to shoot using that method. And so everything was then taken to a post-production facility and, and the effects were added in afterwards. But Which yeah. It's simply. It was like, okay. Yeah, it was a lot Flipped easier, it. yeah. <laughs> All he did was flip it. Uh, but yeah, like you said, uh, when we see the first reveal of the Predator, because I guess in the Predator's culture, if, if no one has a weapon and they're facing you, you have to be face-to-face. -face. It's almost like a samurai you know it's, it's got that honor about it what did you f i know what i thought when i first saw him but what did you think of the the makeup and the predator when you first saw him uh, as a kid i was always kind of really wary about a man in a suit probably just because of when i was a kid i, I used to watch a lot of the sort of the 40s and 50s horror movies and creature from the black lagoon things like that mm -hmm. so i was concerned i think when i first saw it that oh, it's just a guy in a suit what's scary about that but two movies over the years have, led, you know, have kind of put that concern of mine, totally quashed it. And that's Alien, or Aliens as well, and Predator, because the design of the creatures, and particularly the design of Predator, in some ways is just disgusting to look at, and done so well. And, you know, when you think about the fact that Stan Winston had around about 10 people just operating the head of the Predator in that final showdown with Arnold, particularly when the mandibles are all coming out and it's and it's screaming. It's just an incredible piece of engineering, isn't it? It is. When I remember he took that helmet off, and I was thinking maybe it was going to be like, you know, one of the greys, this big bug eye, and maybe two fangs, you know, coming <laughs> out. But then when the Predator takes off that mask and you look at him and when he screams and you see that he has a mouth inside of another mouth. Yeah. And that thing is being operated for the first time, I think, in cinematic history by radio signals. It's yeah. done wirelessly. Yeah. And when Kevin Peter Hall in his, in his seven foot six frame does the body movements, you know, like saying like, okay, now it's on. And he screams at Arnold. You're just like, holy shit, this thing, this thing looks amazing. You've never seen before. And him fighting Arnold, you know, and then Arnold trying to fight him back. And he's like, not a good idea. <laughs> and Arnold could just do as big as Arnold is. The only thing he could do is run away, which I would, well, I would have done. <laughs> it's so iconic as well when, he, when, when, it's, when it's revealed. You know, because I think initially when I first saw it, I thought that the mask that the Predator wears was it. That was its makeup. That's Agreed. what it looked like. Agreed, yes. And then when it sort of starts on doing things and taking the mask off and, and you realize that, you know, it's the mask is there to help it kind of adjust to our climate and, and, and to, to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, when it's revealed, and especially when it speaks as well, because even now that voice is pretty chilling. Yeah. And uh, we do have an iconic line during this whole fighting, too, don't we? You're one ugly motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think people say constantly every day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the, the ending is great. It's a great end, you know, because Arnold set up little traps. He's, you know, through this meantime, he's been hunting the Predator and he, since he can't use mechanical weapons, he's using what's around him. The Predator, you know, he's 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 beating Arnold pretty bad. And until the very end here, where, you know, he's... What does Dave McRae like to say? I'm here. Come on, kill me. I'm over here. <laughs> Come on, do it. Do it now. <laughs> Predator's not that stupid. <laughs> but, it must uh, be. I mean, Arnie has a bit of a defense here for kind of taking a bit of a beating. Because apparently he had the shits throughout the shoot <laughs> he had bad food didn't he yeah he uh, he he um he would on his day off he would go into the local town and and eat fast food and things like that and um he got really sick and a lot of the crew got really sick and, and what ended up happening was that because they, they were so scared of getting sick from the local food 
um, a lot of them stopped eating. Mm-hmm. Um, and John McTiernan points out that as the movie goes on, you can see that Arnie is losing weight throughout the film. There's some, there's particularly one or two sequences where he's, where facially is a hell of a lot skinnier than, than what he is in the earlier part of the film. And it was simply because he just avoided eating. I don't saying he didn't eat at all, but he was just a lot more careful about what he ate. And, um, yeah, the predator gave him a, a whooping while he, <laughs> while he was pupping. <laughs> and he would learn from being on set uh, for the Predator while filming Total Recall because that was also filmed in Mexico as well. Him and Paul, the director for Total Recall, ordered their food out instead of eating local catering. Yeah. And he was he's like, I'm not doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul and him, you know, they, they were fine while the whole rest of the crew got sick. So he learned from the Predator that you don't eat locally. Yeah. You know, um, but what, what did you um, what did you think of the ending? Now, like, did, did this bother you a little bit, or do you think it was it was good? I mean, to see what happened to the predator. The movie itself cost eighteen million to make, mm-hmm. eighteen million dollars, and there was throughout because there were all sorts of problems throughout the shoot. Um, they didn't properly get to do the ending that they wanted because I think originally they wanted to have the Predator spaceship, and I think part of the final battle was done on board the spaceship, if I remember right. Right, yes. Um, But the studio, Fox, made cuts because of the delays and that kind of stuff, and so it didn't happen at all. I I love the way it ends. I don't think there's anything wrong with the way it ends. Maybe you can answer this, being probably more familiar with the movie than I am. When the Predator kind of self-destructs at the end, John McTiernan says on the commentary that he detonates a nuke. I know it's a big explosion, but was it nuclear? Um, it could have been, um, depending on, you know, the, the size of the blast. But according to the second one, it took Keyes' character, Gary Busey's character, Keyes, says it takes out several blocks. You and I both know that several blocks is a very wide definition of how many. It could be anyone from two to, you know, a thousand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, or maybe under ten. But certainly when, when Arnold jumps from that initial blast, he's probably protected from that mound or a hill that he got, you know, away from. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I kinda so. like the ending because it just proves, you know, that it's it's defiance. You know, you're not gonna kill me. I'm gonna kill myself and I'm gonna take whatever's around me. And that seems to be um uh, how most of the predators in every series, we've seen that self destruction. I think in every single one. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I mean, the, the the also the when Anna is kind of trying to explain to, I think at this point there's not many of the guys left, is there? There's Dutch and maybe Billy, mm-hmm. um, and who else would be there? Punch would probably be there as well. When she's explaining the, the the kind of mythology behind it all, because do we know how long the Predator has been on the planet? According to AVP, um, since Aztec times. So it's so the shot at the start of the movie when it kind of crash lands on Earth, yeah, is way back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but okay. we think that this for this first Predator, you know, Anna says uh, in her reminiscing story, like you said, she's been finding their village has been finding their men skinned and and hunted so we think that the predator has been taking care of a lot of people in that area yeah which i would think would make a great prequel in my opinion going back to you know learning about anna's history and Hmm. the original predator and going back to going back to the you know the origin stories (laughs) no not aztec times Um, (laughs) going back to dinosaurs um But, you know, how much did this movie make? The movie made, I think it made, I did write it down here. Like almost 100 million? Uh, It was was just under 100 million globally. It wasn't a huge, huge success. I guess you're talking 35 years ago now. Jesus, that makes me feel so old. But 35 years ago, it did 98 million. Um, I think initially that because of marketing involved in everything, I think it just about broke even in the US. Uh, So it wasn't a runaway success, but it was just... It was kind of, it had a life afterwards. Uh, and then three years later, they, obviously they made Predator 2, which is good. I think we should maybe even do an episode on Predator 2 at some stage, because I, it's a shame that Arnie wasn't 
cast in it. Um, but, you know, I think, yeah, I think Danny Glover does a kind of admirable job in that film. Uh, and it's, and, and change, the change of backdrop is is welcome as well, I think. So we're not just in the kind of concrete jungle, jungle. All the time. Yeah, yeah, the concrete jungle, yeah. Um, I mean, the Predator is certainly an icon, isn't he? Absolutely. Right? How many movies has that made so far? Six? Including Alien? I think it's... So you've got Predator, Predator 2... Predators, The Predator, AVP, AVP Requiem 6, yeah. So, so it's one of those, it is one of those instantly recognizable icons of, of cinema. You know, I think everybody who kind of sees that image straight away knows exactly what it is. What does it have to do to become a relevant again? Because after two, all of them become kind of dump. <laughs> kind of sh- shitty. They do, yeah. I, know, I don't know what you can do other than, you know, <laughs> redesign the look of it go back to making the story simple um, because the last movie was just was kind of like a like a slasher film wasn't it not the last movie AVP Requiem yeah. was kind of like a slasher film and we talked I, about that on our yeah, terrible sequence yeah we did I didn't actually mind The Predator I felt sorry for Shane Black because he'd you know, he'd he'd worked really hard on it, and then the studio kind of took it out of his hands and did what they wanted to do, and he was kind of, like, sidelined. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's as bad as everybody makes out. I think it's okay. I think my expectations were in the gutter when I watched it, so I came out of it thinking, yeah, it was all right, you know? I can't agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, once I saw the ending, you know, the, the, this, the actual predator that we know and love and that part that species sent us a weapon to help out to help us out fight this these this these other predators that are genetically modifying themselves it's i I don't get that part i certainly know that through history through the comic books and the mood and the um the the novels that they don't have a problem with us they're not at war with us they're just you know uh, a tribal society and there's even parts where uh, in, a, in a novel where a human becomes part of a predator tribe. But that's getting really deep. Um, yeah, yeah. I do. do you think they should they should get back to the drawing board with the predator and make it look completely different? Or do you think that then it becomes something else? Yeah, it becomes... I remember when we first saw the predators and I saw the, the different species. And I was just like, no, it has to go back to the original. Uh, I'm sure they could find somebody who had... Uh, Kevin Peter Hall's body type, this long, sleek. Because in part two, um, it's him again. And they kept yeah. the same look. It's just they use different weapons. And he certainly had the movement down pat. And when they, at the end we see multiple predators, it's all him. They just yeah. superimposed yeah. him all over yeah. the screen. Yeah. Um, but I think you and I both have fond memories of, and still continue to have fond memories of Predator. One last yeah. question. Terminator or Predator? If you could choose, Ooh. watch one. And they're on the they're on at the same time. I'm not going to tell you which one's your favorite. Oh wow! I think I mean I love Terminator so much. This is a tough one, but I think purely because the film hasn't dated very much, just because of the setting, you know everything's so neutral in it. Technology is really neutral. Um, you know, a gun's a gun. You know, and you, you look at a gun now and a gun. 35 years ago there's not much difference between them Mm -hmm. all the you know there's no dodgy haircuts to worry about i think predator has stood the test of time for sure it's such a neutral location that they're in that nothing's aged at all they're in the jungle they're in you know there's just just trees for fuck's sake mctiernan made films look so beautiful and sound so good as well you know you've only got to look at the likes of um, Die Hard and Hunt for Red October and you know he, he just made some absolutely fantastic looking movies and they really hold up today the, the, the sound mix just sounds brilliant on it and the performances are really solid I'm, uh, I'm on my list I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose Junior over uh, Predator <laughs> <laughs> no Predator's up there with um, I, I think it would go Total Recall for me then Predator and Jingle uh, All the Way and then Jingle All the Way <laughs> uh, but yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, that was Predator. We hope you enjoyed it. And uh, what we got coming up? Uh, if we do a bonus episode next week, I'm not sure whether we are, but if we do, then that will be our penultimate episode of this series. And our final episode is going to be The Return of the Living Dead. Can't wait. 
That's going to be fun. Oh, we're yeah. going to have some laughs, aren't we? <laughs> it's not a bad question, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, as always, stick to the roads. And the best of luck. <laughs> <laughs>